And I think we're going to start because we have a full schedule for you. And so welcome to each and every one. If you don't mind, if you could mute your, your mics for us. And happy Teacher Appreciation Day and Week. Wow, a lot to celebrate. And so if you can, we know that you're in your schools and different locations. If you can please rename yourselves and identify who you represent. So we are delighted to see the representation from Region 2 and the entire nation of schools, districts, uh, state ed departments, higher education, educational agencies, and the U.S. Department of Education with a special thank you to our program officer, Brian Cohane and Rebecca Myers. Thank you for joining us. And we know this time of year, here we are, May 9th, and we are in the middle of closing the end of school, maybe finishing up some of our testing. We have graduations going on. And the reason that I'm saying this, because we do value you, we appreciate you, and thank you for participating in the series. And if you don't mind, if you could put your mics on, thank you. So this session was developed specifically to support you in your respective roles to improve educator recruitment and retention. I am Donna Elam, Senior Advisor for EX South. And before we hear from our whole team of researchers and practitioners, uh, and also hear from the President and CEO, Raymond Pierce of the Southern Education Foundation, let me share some of the, our team members from EX South. And they continue to work diligently to create these information webinars for you. And we're for looking you. forward to the rest of the year. So we have Director Tanya Gentry. We have Senior Study Directors Carrie Murthy and Darcy Patrika. We have Chelsea Sorensen and Emily Overdorf with us, assisting us with this presentation and the research behind it. We also have guest speakers. We have Sharif Almeki, the founder and CEO of Black Educator Development, and you'll hear more from him today. And we have a story from the South, Dr. Terry Lamar from Hoover City Schools, Alabama. And we're excited for all of us to be here with you. So let me share a little bit about South at the Southern Education Foundation. It's one of four federally funded regional centers across the nation, providing tailored support to address issues of equity. And Region 2, you heard me refer to you as Region 2. The states are Alabama, Arkansas, District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. And if we can go to the next slide, thank you. So this journey to excellence in equity is a collaborative one. And you just heard just pulling the researchers and practitioners together. It's a collaboration and education always has been a collaborative one. And that's why multiple voices are so important in all of our work every single day. And if you could, thank you. So what does that mean for us? It means when we focus on equity and excellence, it means that we focus intentionally on what we measure, what we monitor, and how we can support our teachers and our students. And for this series, we are grounding the entire series from our need sensing for, with all the states in the region that you just heard me name, as well as evidence-based research from the consensus study report published by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Math on monitoring equity indicators. The study has seven domains and 16 equity indicators that we, we will be sharing each of the webinars will have a focus. 
and and we'll keep unpacking that for you as we go through the presentation. Thank you, Chelsea. Chelsea has also put in the chat uh, the National Academy of Science Equity Indicator Overview for you. Please, all the resources that we are sharing with you, they are just vital. So many gays across the nation are now using that in their conversations in equity. But EXL at Southern Education Foundation is launching this series. And so on the left, you see equitable access to high quality curricula and instruction. That's the domain for today's webinar. And how do we measure that? Remember we said it's intentional and it's important to measure so that we can address the outcomes, disparities and create opportunities. So disparities for this webinar is looking at the access and opportunities and resources, disparities in access to effective teaching, and they are measured by teachers' years of experience, credentials, and the diversity of the teaching force. Thank you. And we want you to listen very, very closely. And if you have a volume on your computers to put it up a little bit so that we can hear the Raymond Pierce, who is the CEO and president of the Southern Education Foundation. He'll share a few words with us. Good afternoon. My name is Raymond Pierce, and I'm the president of the Southern Education Foundation. And the Southern Education Foundation is proud to be the new host for the United States Department of Education's Equity Assistance Center here in the southern region of the United States. Equity Assistance Centers are established by the federal government to provide technical assistance and support to school districts, public school districts, that are struggling with issues of equity in four specific areas attached to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Those four areas are issues dealing with race, national origin, sex, and religion. Today's webinar will provide you information on the important issue of teacher shortage, which is which important impacts all areas in, in public education. The United States is facing a very severe shortage of teachers and that shortage is most, most acute in specific areas like science and math. And many of our school districts are struggling and it's obviously negatively impacting our students. So today's webinar brings you a number of professional individuals very learned in this area of teacher development and will provide useful tips and information for school districts on how to retain, attract school district teachers and, and keep them, retain them. So I hope you find this webinar interesting and it's so helpful and you can use it and dealing with some of the many challenges our school districts are dealing with. But this will be one of many other webinars to follow with very useful information for our public schools. Thank you very much. And so you've met him virtually, Raymond Pierce. And just recently, Mr. Pierce has been published in many articles, but recently in Forbes magazine, about reviving America's pipeline of Black teachers. And we are so fortunate to have a researcher and a practitioner who was who supplied a lot of the information that went into that article, that publication. So let me share with you. Can we go? Okay. Our country is hurting immensely from an overall shortage of teachers is a quote right out of that article. The need for good teachers is even more dire for certain populations. More than 50% of students in US public schools are children of color, yet only about 20% of teachers are people of color. Most black students in the United States attend 13 years of public school without having a single black teacher. And a third point made in the article, according to the CBED, the US needs an additional 280,000 black teachers in public schools to reach a similar proportion of black teachers and students. And so we have the great fortune today to have Karif Almeki with us who will share his story, his strategies and insights and some of the resources that he shared with Mr. Pierce for that article. Let me just tell you a little bit about Sharif. 
Sharif El Meki, founding CEO of the Center for Black Educator Development. Prior to founding the center, Sharif El Meki served as a nationally recognized principal and U.S. Department of Education Principal Ambassador Fellow. His school, Mastery Charter Shoemaker, was recognized by President Obama and Oprah Winfrey and was awarded the prestigious Epic Award for three consecutive years as being amongst the top three schools in the country for accelerating students' achievement levels. The Shoemaker campus was also recognized as one of the top 10 middle school and top 10 high schools in the state of Pennsylvania for accelerating the achievement levels of African-American students. In 2019, Mr. Elmeki founded the fellowship, Black Male Educators for Social Justice, an organization dedicated to recruiting, retaining, and developing Black male teachers. Without further ado, we present to you our first speaker. I'm passing the mic to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, you know, it's great to be here, you know, amongst you all as you're trying to address complex and entrenched issues, you know, one of them around teacher diversity and teacher effectiveness. I can tell you a little bit, you know, about my background, you know, to follow up to Donna is that I was on my way to law school when someone recruited me to become a teacher. And if it wasn't for that, if I was not invited into the profession, I would not be sitting here with you today. And when I started the fellowship with other young black men from all over the country, the reason we started it was because there were black men who were thinking about leaving the profession. And we knew that there were about 1.3, we knew less than in it, it, you know, there are variances every year, but generally less than 2% of public school teachers are black men. And at the same time, black men who attend HBCUs and have a college degree, teaching is their number one career choice. And so we have two things, that there are black men who are interested so how do we get more of them into college, particularly HBCUs, where they express an interest in becoming teachers? And then also the stark numbers of less than 2%. And I would not have become one of those you know, 2% of Black men educators. And the brothers that we were supporting were on their way out the door. So we can begin to convene them and bring them together to really problem solve, talk about what issues that they had, what supports that they needed. And we ended up formalizing this. This went on for a few years, but then what we recognized was we did not have a pathway into teaching where we could invite young youth of color to consider teaching. And it was almost in districts across the country, we're expecting them to organically consider becoming educators because they were students in the past. There were 17 of us who started the fellowship in 2014. And what we recognized was not a single one of us had been invited into the profession until after we graduated from college. We were from all over the country, but we were all working in Philadelphia. Many of them were thinking about transitioning out of the profession. The first thing we did was start asking our, we did a little bit of action research and we asked our colleagues, most of them were white women, when did they initially become interested in teaching? And the average response was third grade was when they recalled someone tapping them on the shoulder and inviting them into the profession. Some adult, usually an educator, engaging them about why they would be fantastic at leading a classroom. So we had third grade for one group of people. And for us, it was after we had graduated. So post back for one group, third grade for another. And so that really led me to understand that we needed a pipeline, a pipeline that's effective, sustainable, predictable for youth to understand what steps, but then also protect it. And how do we protect a pipeline that's insulated, that has pillars? So at the Center for Black Educated Development, we look at this in three ways. One around policy and advocacies, you know, and advocacy efforts. What are the policies that can support an effective black teacher pipeline? The second part that we have is professional learning. We call these the three Ps, professional learning. What is the ecosystem? What are all the professional learning opportunities for not only current and aspiring black educators, but educators writ large? And how do we support schools and leadership teams and district leadership teams 
to consider how do we not only recruit, but how do we start with the idea of retention? And so we, even when we look at attrition rates, if we start with re retention and backwards design the same way that we prepare our educators to backwards design their unit maps, their lesson plans, if we did that with a pipeline, it would be far more effective. So we provide professional learning. And then the other one is pathways. How do we invite youth? The youth who wanna change the world anyway and show them how changing the world can be linked to leading a classroom and but doing it effectively. Those three pillars stand up our, our Black teacher pipeline. And we connect CTE credits, dual enrollment credits, where we try to engineer where our high school students can graduate high school with an associate's degree in education along with their diploma. That means they're halfway there. They've already been thinking about it. They've already been considering it. But then we connect that to a paid teacher apprenticeship. And this is, again, a story that, of a student I experienced when I was a principal. And I knew this young lady wanted to be a teacher. And she was catching a bus to, to ride about an hour's distance away, basically to flip burgers in a chain restaurant in a, in a, sub, a suburb. This, this student said that she was never engaged in how to, and I teased her a little bit. I was like, you know, this is my student. I'm the principal. I was like, why are you going to flip burgers? You said you want to be a teacher. Why aren't you, you know, like working on that? And she said, when I tell people outside of school that I want to be a teacher, they say, oh, you love kids. You should babysit. When she tells educators, some of her own teachers, hey, I'm interested in becoming a teacher. They tell her, oh, can you stay after school and help me grade papers? Or can you help me with my bulletin board? And she said, what I was desirous of is learning how to, what's the, the mindset, the skill, and the will necessary to be an effective leader of a classroom. And she said there was no opportunities for her to engage with that. And that is why we began this, this program. I'm going to ask, you know, if we can go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll end with this. In Philadelphia, as diverse as our, our city is, and the, the work to, to diversify the educated force, what we recognized based off this research and these numbers was that if there's not very deliberate, specific, and nuanced efforts to recruit, support, and retain, we, won't, we, won't gonna, we weren't going to reach our, our goals. As a matter of fact, we, we did not reach our goals in one particular category. We were able, as a city, to increase the number of diverse teachers, all except Black teachers. And black teachers, we lost over 1,100 black teachers over the past two decades. And this is from Research for Action. I will follow up and put it in the chat, the report that you can read. But it shows to me, and it just really reinforced for us how deliberately we have to engineer the educated workforce and the, and the, the pipeline that supports them. Because even a, a diversification effort, it didn't connect all of the dots. It didn't invite enough people in, but most importantly, it did not retain because these black educators were actually within our schools, within our district, and we lost over 1,100. Even while other educators increased and the, the number of teachers overall in our city has been pretty stagnant. So it's not like that we lost a ton of teachers and it, it disproportionately hit you know, the, the black community. No, it's been pretty much a stable number of teachers in our city, but because there was not a, a deliberate effort to want to monitor, to support, to create feedback loops, to engage people in, and get additional data about how they're experiencing the leadership, how they're experiencing their school, they left. And we did not realize it till much afterwards when there was in-depth research performed by Research for Action, a local research firm. And so what I encourage all of us to do is to continue to not only think about the end game and backwards design, but what are the pillars that will be effectively implemented to be used to support educators of color, which also will mean supporting all educators. I wanna thank you again, and I'm looking forward to being in community with you and in partnership as you continue on this journey. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Sharif. And thank you for sharing your story. We have a minute or so, Carrie, are we gonna open questions to Sheree first before we go to the Mentimeter? 
Okay. Do we have any questions? Let's look at the chat. I saw Dawn asked about the first P for pillar. So the first one is policy and advocacy. Mm -hmm. The second one is professional learning and that's for everyone. Often when we hear about professional learning, we hear about teachers. But what we have learned is HR and talent officers need professional learning. Principal coaches need professional learning. You know, we actually created a, a teacher retention toolkit. And initially people said, oh, we want this for principals. And we said, we won't design it for principals, but we will design it for school leadership teams and principal supervisors. Because often principals were giving us feedback that their immediate supervisor was unable to support them to develop their leadership teams in ways that could help with recruitment and retention. And when we surveyed them, many of them said, a principal said like, we never learned how to develop a leadership team. We were effective with our students and eventually we became principals, but we never actually learned how to develop a leadership team. And so that's how, why we designed the toolkit to support leadership teams. And then the third one of the pathways, engaging high school and college youth to enter the field. So sorry, that was a long answer for the first question. Hopefully- That was know, wonderful, a, Sharif. And thank you. And you're getting shout outs in the chat as well. And thank you. You are so busy and just getting a hold of you was fortunate for us, but being a collaborative partner now, we're really, really, really quite fortunate. I'm just as fortunate. And thank you for, for the work and thank you. I've never not been in community with others doing this work. And so I'm excited about the community that you all have already established and I'm looking forward to, to joining and learning. Thank you so much. And you can see just the touching the tip of the iceberg that Sharif, Sharif shared with us, this domain on diverse teacher pipeline is, we can't cover it in just one session. So we will have continuous sessions on this to talk about all the different demographics of multilingual, Hispanic, Black teachers coming together, Asian teachers, so that we have a voice, a multiple voice for our students to to see and to, to learn under. So right now we're going to segue to our Mentimeter. Carrie, did you want to share how, or Emily? It's what is the current trend of educator turnover in your district? And so you have a code and you also have the Mentimeter in the chat. Thank you for putting that in there, Emily. And so as you answer, we'll watch your responses. So what is the current trend of educator turnover shortages in your school or district? So the choices are more turnover shortages compared to last year, about the same as last year, less turnover, fewer shortages compared to last year, or not sure. So let's see. It looks like more turnover shortages as it's coming in. Okay, so yeah, the majority, we're seeing more turnover shortages compared to last year. I'm looking to see if we have anything in the chat. So just think we represent an entire region with multiple states and you see where that's going. So Carrie, are you ready? I am ready. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. So building on what we just heard from Raymond and Sharif and just kind of reiterating why we're all here together today, right? We know that coming out of the pandemic, our country is experiencing educator shortages. And as we see from these headlines, and as you well know already and just shared with us in the Menti, that's certainly true for many of you, many Southern states that we serve through the Equity Assistance Center South. And reiterating what, uh, what Donna was saying earlier too, kind of sharing some of the data points from that Forbes article, we know that the proportion of teachers of color does not align with the proportion of K through 12 students of color. And we know that there are many K through 12 students who have limited or no exposure to teachers of color through their entire K through 12 experience. So why does this matter? 
This matters because we know that all students benefit from having educators of color. And there is a growing research base that supports this. Having a diverse array of educators benefits all students by providing all students with a diverse range of role models, by countering racism and negative stereotypes, by promoting intercultural understanding, and by preparing students of all backgrounds to live in an increasingly diverse and complex world. Studies have found that when upper elementary students are randomly assigned to a teacher of color, they are better at completing tasks and are more engaged. They score higher on end of year tests for math and English language arts, and they attend school more frequently. These effects hold true for both students of color and white students, and the effects on test scores and chronic absenteeism persist up to six years later when those students are in high school. This is significant, especially as so many districts are grappling with engagement and attendance coming out of the pandemic. So again, having teachers of color benefits all students and it can be an important equity driver with significant potential to help close opportunity gaps. One study found that black students who had a single black teacher, just one, were 13% more likely to enroll in college. With two black teachers, that number jumped to 32%. Another study found that the graduation rate among black students increased by 33% if they had at least one black teacher between third and fifth grade. Again, this is significant. And I could go on, there's certainly more I could say, more research I could reference about the importance of this, but we want to move on to some strategies and promising practices so you can hopefully leave today's session with some new ideas to bring to your work. So to kick off this discussion, we have another Mentimeter activity. So please scan that QR code again or go to menti.com and enter the code. It's also there in the chat if you just want to click on it. And I'm going to advance to that next Menti. So what recruitment and retention strategies have been effective in your district? We wanted to create some space for all of us to share with each other. We know that many of you are doing this work on the ground and we'd love to hear what's going well. What recruitment and retention strategies have been effective in your district? So take a minute to think about that and respond and then I'll advance. Starting to see some of the answers come in. Here we go. Okay, and so Donna, part, feel free to talk through as they come in. Thank you, Carrie. So partnerships with local universities, job fairs at ABC, historical black colleges and universities, partnerships with local universities, affinity groups. It's so many coming in, Carrie, we could take turns. <laughs> <laughs> Signing bonuses, additional teacher support and mentoring, focus on teacher wellness, well-being, intentional recruiting at job fairs. There's that word intentional again. Mm -hmm. Offering medical insurance benefits for the teacher and their family. Part job fairs, partnerships with universities, building relationships, relationships with local colleges, focus on developing homegrown teachers, introducing the idea of teaching as a profession to our students while they are in high school, similar to what Sharif just shared with us, and strong teacher supports that help with retention, make recruitment easier too. And that was so important when, when we were planning this work, this webinar with Sharif and the team, you know, when he started, he started off talking about retention, just not recruitment. And so often we think recruitment is the only answer. It's the combination. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about some of the strategies of once we 
do recruit part of the retention, and I won't share the end of that story. We'll hear that from Dr. Lamar from Hoover. Okay. I love these ideas. Sharif, I'm so happy that you're with us there. Wonderful. Well, thank yeah. you everyone for sharing those. And Donna, I think I turn it back to you now to introduce our next speaker. Yes. And four strategies and promising practices to address educator recruitment and retention. And actually, Darcy, before I turn it back over to you, I also want to go back to the mentee real quick and switch to the next, because the next one is sharing a key takeaway or strategy that resonated with you. And I want this to go ahead and be open so that as you're listening, you can, if there's something that really resonates as you're listening to the strategies and as you're listening to Dr. Lamar, go ahead and jot those down and we're going to come back to this at the end. So with that, over to you, Darcy. Darcy, okay. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I promise I won't keep you all that long from Dr. L Dr. Lamar. But I did want to say it was so exciting to see. Thank you for sharing your strategies. And it's exciting to see that some of the strategies that you mentioned are certainly ones that we'll be highlighting. So when thinking about the strategies that meet the needs of your district, you first want to know about the, the educators in your district. Even the neighboring districts might vary tremendously. Are your educators reflective of your students in your community? And how do you know? What data are you collecting and what additional data might you want to collect? Once you decide that and collect the data, you wanna analyze it, disaggregating by race. Also, we wanted to note that while we're focusing on race today, remember that diversity refers to much more than race. We'll share a resource following this presentation called the Diversity Wheel that can help you think through the many dimensions of diversity, intersectionality, and how we might want to disaggregate data. So once you have a picture of your educator workforce, consider forming an advisory or work group of stakeholders to set clear goals about where you want to go. And I know you haven't forgotten because it came up in the Mentimeter, but we wanted to highlight the need and importance of working with your local educator preparation programs. They have data related to their candidates' diversity, so create and nurture those partnerships with those programs, especially those who tend to prepare diverse candidates. And it sounds like that is what you all are doing. So that's wonderful. So once you have your goals, create strategies, which is what we're focusing on now. And think about how you want to measure and keep up to date on progress towards those goals. Identify and dedicate resources to intentionally recruit and hire a diverse workforce. And as Sharif mentioned, don't forget to work with your HR department. Look at your district's recruiting and hiring strategies and processes and ensure that any materials related to your district show a diverse workforce, which I know is something that Dr. Dr. Lamar is going to talk about. And so in addition to, co to collecting data, educators' voices are essential. So when thinking about getting and keeping educators in the classroom, you need to understand specifically in your community the challenges your educators are facing and the supports that would be helpful. There are many formal and informal, low-cost ways to hear from your educators. A few, such as surveys, focus groups, and exit interviews are listed here. When you intentionally create ways to hear from educators and look at that feedback disaggregated by race, you may uncover trends. For example, recent studies found that teachers of color are leaving at higher rates than their peers, which we just were hearing about, and the reasons cited included microaggressions and the, quote, invisible tax educators of color often pay. This includes additional responsibilities due to their race, such as disciplining students of color, teaching the school community about racism, and serving as a liaison to families of color. Once you've collected and analyzed your data and feedback, consider creative ways that you can provide supports to staff members. And these do not have to be expensive. For example, it is critical to share, acknowledge, and act on educator feedback. If not, teacher voice goes unheard and the school culture and morale may be negatively impacted. So here's an example, a real example from a district in Texas. They surveyed their teachers and identified two major needs, supplies and copying and planning time. In response, they created a make it, take it center. They put supply closets in all schools and they implemented a new calendar to support more planning time. And this is a great example of acting on teacher voice. We do want to note, however, that it likely will not be possible to act on all feedback, nor would you necessarily want to. 
but sharing and acknowledging it is important, as is, as is sharing any changes that result from the feedback. Transparency is certainly key. And then districts should also provide meaningful and relevant, relevant professional learning. When teachers get good quality professional learning, they tend to stay more often than teachers who don't, which is a quote from a recent report from Harvard. Districts should emphasize instructional practice over content knowledge. It should offer materials versus general principles and focus on relationships, both between administrators and teachers, teachers and students, and the school and the community. Provide timely feedback as well as follow-up opportunities and offer diversity, equity, and inclusion training for all, as we heard Sharif mention, including hiring managers, administrators, and counselors. It's also important to embed early career support and leadership opportunities. Teachers learn from one another and they thrive in more collaborative environments. So create systems of support of and for teachers. And provide strategic one-on-one -on -one support. Mentors, for example, can be a great resource, particularly if they are assigned purposefully. Consider using a mentor matching tool, which we included in the resources. It's a free tool. It's just a survey that you give to the mentor and the potential mentee, and it's really shown to be effective in districts in Florida in particular. Create and highlight leadership opportunities that do not require leaving the classroom. These could be informal or unpaid, such as even leading a book club for other staff members. And so together we shared strategies for providing support to your educators. So now we want to talk about what you all really highlighted in the Mentimeter, which is creating partnerships and pathways to teaching in the district, because your communities have a lot to offer. So we want to ask you to think about some untapped assets in your district. For example, are there parents or guardians who might be interested in becoming paraprofessionals or teachers? Are there career changers, veterans, high school students? We saw some mention of that. Educators in the community are more likely to stay in the community and also more likely to be reflective of your community. And then think about if there are barriers for them entering or completing their certification requirements. Is it transportation, their jobs, their schedules, the time classes are offered, childcare? By first identifying untapped resources and then identifying the barriers to entering the education workforce, you can come up with solutions to support them. And fostering community partnerships can assist. As previously mentioned, community colleges and educator prep programs can be valuable partners who can tailor programs to the needs of both your district and your potential candidates. Local organizations such as the Chamber of Commerce, businesses, and religious organizations, they may be able to help you get the word out about opportunities and provide support, not just money or in-kind donations, but perhaps childcare, transportation, and more. Communities have a vested interest in supporting a strong and diverse educator workforce whether it is to support their own children, the community, or even future employees with the skills needed to work in their industries. You should, can also look at creating pathways into the classroom, such as grow your own programs, apprenticeships, which we just heard about, high school academies, dual enrollment programs, and just alternative pathways to certification with, for which your district could even be the authorizer. And I will close out by turning into, not turning into, turning to the elephant in the room, which is compensation. There's no denying that money is important. There are educators across the country, as you know, who cannot afford to even live in the communities in which they teach. More than that, many educator salaries make it difficult to support themselves and their families. And we know it might not be feasible to increase your district salaries in the immediate future, but you can think about out-of-the-box ways to provide strategic compensation such as bonuses or even thinking about alternative salary structures. And compensation isn't just about money, though of course that's important. It can also reference celebrations and recognitions. Just last week, I'm not sure if you all are aware, but the president and the first lady recognized the teachers of the year at the White House in the Rose Garden. It was pretty phenomenal from what I understand. You can also think about gift cards from local vendors, staff breakfasts, shout outs in the morning announcements, local papers, school newsletters. That can go a long way in showing appreciation. You can consider release time or additional planning time or alternative ways to structure the school day or even the work week. And I know we're all here today because we know that we can work together to 
create a more positive narrative around teaching as a profession, even if it is one district, one school, one person at a time. And so as Donna mentioned in the opening, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. So we want to use this as a call to really celebrate and promote our teachers and really focus on that. And so I'm going to turn it back to Donna, who did introduce Dr. Lamar, but I'll let her say a few words too. But I invite you to share in the chat ways that your districts are celebrating and, and really just showing appreciation to your teachers. So thank you. And Donna, I'll turn it back to you. We, it seemed like it was really received well when we bring practitioners in that are actually implementing these best practices. So we have to do a shout out to Superintendent D. Fowler, Superintendent of Hoover City Schools, as we introduce Dr. L Terry Lamar. And Dr. Lamar is the Hoover City Schools Chief Administrator Officer. His previous title was the Director of Equity and Educational Initiatives, another intention of combining equity with educational initiatives. That's important. That is not, it's not siloed. He completed his undergraduate work at the University of Alabama and has experience as a physical education teacher, school counselor, assistant principal, and principal. He obtained his doctorate from Sanford University. Dr. Lamar is passionate about working with at-risk students and providing guidance to their families. He strongly advocates empowering the youth with the personalized tools they need to make wise, lifelong decisions. And I just want to add something about Hoover. Hoover landed on four national top 10 lists with substantial gains for students in poverty, Black students and Hispanic students, with increases of three to four months learning gains in reading and math from 2019 to 2022. And, and these reports and the studies were from the nation's report card and the ACA list in Alabama, conducted by Harvard and Stanford universities. And so we'd like to bring <laughs> Dr. Lamar. So the floor is yours, Dr. Lamar. Well, thank you. I'm going to honor my youngest son who said, Dad, you did a, pres a presentation. Please do not say any corny jokes. So I won't start off with any jokes or anything <laughs> like that. So I'll just get to the actual uh, presentation since it's being recorded, that is. And so, uh, but I really want to talk about Hoover. I, I will say this just to echo what you said, Dr. Elam. Our HR department, they're on here as well, Ms. Christy Williams and Dr. Carrie Pate Davison and Dr. D. Fowler. And I will say that this entire process would not look the way it does and it would not have had the success without them part of this process as well. So I do want to recognize them as we, we move, move forward here. But I wanted to give a snapshot into Hoover because it's, it's hard to really talk about what you're doing if you, can't, if you don't know exactly what it looks like. And you can see in Hoover, we have rated about 58% of our population is white. We're looking at about 25, 26% of our population is, is African-American. And you can see the male-female ratio. So, and we're looking at about 13,452 students when you add in our preschool programs. And in our district, there are more than 50 languages that are spoken here. And so just a quick snapshot into to it all. So we just move to the next slide. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about are the four components of teacher recruitment. And the first component is truly to have a, an HR plan that outlines the hiring process. And this really serves as the blueprint for hiring new applicants. And it also makes sure that everyone is on the same page because before we had an HR plan, you have one principal that may operate in one form or fashion, another one that will operate very differently. What we're doing now is we're working towards a common goal, and that is to diversify. We've seen a major increase in our principals, our assistant principals, our district level. We're talking about in the 40s to 50 percent in terms of diversity of minority can candidates, African-American candidates for district leaders. These are individuals that are in decision making positions and for our principals, for our assistant principals. And we've also seen an increase in our teachers every single year as well. 
And with that HR plan, part of it is, as I talk about everything that I talk about today would be essentially part of the HR plan. But we are, we're requiring that any, anyone that interviews that panel, it must be diverse. So you must have African-Americans or a diverse panel that would interview applicants. And even on the applicant pool, it must be a diverse applicant pool as well. And if principals cannot find diversity, then they work with our HR program and to, to help facilitate that. And we've seen major increases since we've started this process of diversifying our applicant pool and also our interview pool as well. The second point of the recruitment process would be create a public relations campaign to attract a diverse candidate pool. One of the ways you want to show that celebration of diversity is you want to have those diverse images, the videos, prints of your employees working together. So you want to have African-American leaders and teachers working with white leaders and teachers as well, because if you're an African-American or minority and you're going into a, a district where you will be a minority, you want to know, will I be accepted? Do I see them showing that they celebrate me? Do they celebrate differences? Do they celebrate diversity? And so this is a major way to recruit. Going to HBCUs as a district like Hoover, like we are, it shows that we are serious about recruiting. And we're not just going to the PWIs, we're going to all college and universities. And that helps with the, with the applicant pool as well, just that, that campaign. And when you're at a career fair and you're showing and displaying all the diversity that you, that you, that you have on your table, on the TV, whatever you have in terms of prints, it just really helps with that process also. And if you go to point number three on the recruiting efforts, you want to be able to provide professional development where it maps out where you want your, you know, your school to be and, and how you want those efforts to look. To look. And, and I would say one of the harder conversations I think we've had is when we had to talk to principals. We noticed that from time to time, we would have someone to say to a white applicant as they're interviewing, I'm going to hire this person. That person may not be ready today, but I know in two to three years, that person will be a rock star. And that's pretty huge. And then sometimes we've noticed with our African-American candidates, it was the person's not quite there yet. I think if they get some experience and they come back, I would love to hire them. That's a huge difference in terms of the same candidates that are new teachers. And so making sure that we, we map out, we highlight, no one is doing it with ill intent, but it's just how do we highlight what we're doing, how we're doing as relates to that professional development. So talking through implicit bias as we've done, talking through, you know, you, you, generally speaking, you hire individuals that you relate to and that you that look like you. That's just generally speaking, in a sense, because you, you have that connection by default. And talking through how we want that to look and highlighting it has also helped with our, with our applicants as well. And the last part on the recruitment efforts is using your faculty and staff within the school system. You know, the best marketing tool of any organization is, is the people that work within it. If folks within your organization feel very comfortable and confident and they appreciate and they're being treated well, they're going to go out and be your number one advocates about bringing in other people. And if you've got the relationships, that means that anyone at the district level can call the principal or principal can call a teacher and say, hey, do you know anyone that who would be interested in Hoover City Schools? And so that network that you build based on relationship being very intentional would be critical because I don't know anyone who wants to recommend someone who will not be successful, who did not succeed. And so that's a huge component also when, when anyone looks at a situation, if I make a recommendation for someone, I don't want the superintendent to say, we don't want Terry recommendation because the last four were awful. What you want is folks going to go find the best. So it, it just, it works itself out by default, but you have to have those relationships. So those are the four components of the teacher recruitment. Now, if we go to retention. So once we have the teachers here and we recruited the teachers, now what do we do? So the first point is you want to get to know your new hired backgrounds and understand their, you know, the areas of improvements, what they do well. You know, one of the things I've, that we've noticed are, are our new hires coming from a homogeneous background and how do you support them? For example, 
if you have individuals where they have been in a an, an, an all black or all African American elementary middle, their HBCU, and then all of a sudden they come to Hoover, what supports do we put in place for them? And if we have a, a white candidate or white individuals who have only been around a homogeneous background as well, what are we doing for them as well to make sure that both individuals are understanding each other's and their background and how they operate and how we think? And that is a, a huge part of the retention piece. You know, I will tell you when, when new teachers, this was based on feedback we've gotten with teacher focus groups. When new teachers are hired, they, one of the first thing they look for and search for, do, do you, they feel welcome? Do we want them there? How do they feel? It's all about, not about, are my lessons and my lesson plans great? It is all about the emotional side, the feel side. You know, do they, do they stand by what they, what they say? Do I feel welcome in this, in this building? And so one of the things that we, Dr. Long worked with us on is creating I believe statements. This was huge because when a teacher, when a parent, when a student walks in the door, you can see exactly what is the principal belief. What do the principal believe? What do the teachers believe? What do this community believe? It helps in terms of at least I have something that I can attach onto in that I believe statement. So that, that part about getting to know them is, is critically important and, and also in the supports that you provide. The next part is to build relationships, part number two, through others to connect with your, your new and struggling teachers. Work through others, very similar to on the recruitment side. If you have minority teachers, ask them to build relationships. If you have white teachers or any race of teachers that, that work well with others, have those individuals where they are building those relationships, create opportunities for teachers to collaborate in non-educational settings. Ask them, hey, go out. You all enjoy this right here. We got PD, part of the professional development. I never forget well, one of the principals in Hoover. They part of their professional development was going to the summit. It's like a huge mall here in Birmingham. And it was, you go to the summit, you build relationships, and then you all come back and let's talk through some things. And they paired them up beautifully that where you're going to have to talk, get in the cars together, go, and you all go and shop do whatever you need to, but you have to be together to build that relationship. So those are some of those non-educational settings. You could do that as well. Also, we have here in Hoover, we have a district equity team where anyone can go to someone on that district equity committee and talk with them in general about, hey, I'm having some, some issues. I'm, 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 I'm struggling here and how they can have those conversations there as well. So those are some of those ways we can, you can build the relationships through others and connect. And then point number three is gather that information by conducting teacher focus groups. You want this to be led by teachers, developed by teachers, and have the teachers presented to the district leaders or school leaders, and also to the faculty and staff as well. And so the questions are teacher made, the, the results are going to be based on how folks feel. So it cannot be anyone from the from a district level or your principal leading those those focus groups. It is 100% going to be on the teacher side. We want real raw information and we don't want to damage that by having someone that, that is an evaluator in the room. Also, one of the things that was mentioned earlier, I think by you know, Ms. Arcy, was uh, the equity professional development. We provide that to everyone in the district. We're looking at our teacher, our custodians, our A's, central office. We've done it for our board, our school board as well. Because a lot of times, conversation are had and we are we're miss we're, we're missing each other because we don't get to know each other's and each other's background and the last one i would say here would be number four would be professional development and facetime with school administrators one of one of the best professional developments i, I went to is when he talked about the different generations because it tells so much about all of us and how we can understand each other as well the other part is school principals and assistant principals and district leaders should set up scheduled times with new teachers. You really, you don't want to wait on teachers to set up times for you. And what that does is it gives the teacher a time to build a relationship with you. There are many teachers are afraid if I reach out and initiate those types of conversation and maybe looked upon as a weakness, but if it's an expectation of your, of your school or school district, then what happens in that regards 
it is building a relationship and making each individual feel very comfortable. And that way you don't have to depend on someone else to build the relationships for you. You are doing them by default and by the structure that you have in place for your teacher. So those are just some of the, just a snapshot into what we do in the school district as relates to teacher retention and recruitment efforts. And again, I didn't, didn't have a chance to go through all of it. So I just wanted to hit the highlights there in that regards. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamar. Time goes so fast with this rich information that we are having from all our presenters. We have questions. You can start putting those in the chat and share some takeaways right now. The strategies, I see you've been working on it. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Educated voice is so important. Love the focus on partnerships with the colleges. Celebrating diversity. People should be able to see themselves in the teacher workforce. Loved how Dr. Lamar described the focus groups being facilitated by teachers to ensure a safe space. Education does, does not often talk about PR campaigns and Dr. Lamar's focus on this is a great reminder that it matters other places to do it. And the importance of working with HR and creating those processes and plans, which I'm going to carry because we have one minute and we want to share the resources that are also included in some of our webinars. Absolutely, thank you so thank much. You. So today's session was the second in this series. And so stay tuned as we're going to be rolling out future sessions in this series, which includes some of the topics that you see there on the screen. And as we're looking ahead to those future sessions, we greatly value your feedback so we can continuously improve and make sure these sessions are as valuable as possible. So there is a link in the chat and we'd appreciate if you share your feedback with us. And I also just want to share that we do have a resources slide. We can drop these links in the chat and we will be sharing out these slide decks. So you'll have that as we go. So that brings us to the end right on time as it's 3.30 Eastern. And I just wanna say thank you so much, Dr. Elon for facilitating today. Thank you to Sharif Elmeki, Darcy Patrika, and Dr. Terry Lamar for presenting. And thanks to all of you for spending an hour of your day with us. We know you're very busy. So glad that you could join us. And thank you for completing that survey on your way out. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you and celebrate Teacher Appreciation Week and Day. They have the website for the Southern Education Foundation and the Equity Assistance Center.